Are you sick and tired of being... Prescription for your life. Get ready for your daily dose of Healthy Talk Radio, the show that's empowering your health. And now, here's America's health and lifestyle coach. Five. This is the show where your health is your wealth. Thriving is more important than just surviving, and the only thing lost. Of those unwanted pounds. This is Healthy Talk Radio, talk radio that helps you get well, stay well, and live well. Phone lines are open, 888-283-7272. That's 888 What are you struggling with? Let's talk about it, your health, your life. Remember, if the body can get sick, it can also get well. Lifestyle is the medicine. So the choices that we make every single day can and will determine the kind of health we're going to have. So our choices matter. And the choices we make every single day, they matter. So we want to help you and equip you and give you all the tools that you need to be able to thrive, to be able to make it, to be able to do really, really well. And on this show, to become the best version of you. Let's kick off and go with Peyton. Hi, Peyton. I just wanted to discuss um, sleep issues that I've had for a number of years. Um, See if you might have any suggestions. I've tried a lot of different supplements. Uh, to help me with my sleep. Okay. Well, sleep is, is it's challenging, but it's not. Okay. Because it's multifaceted. It's not just, Hey, t- you can't sleep, take this herb and you'll go to bed. Right. Or take, cause I mean, how many people do you know that take a really strong medication? Some of the most popular ones out there and they can't sleep still. So it tells you that it's not really an issue with chemical as far as like, hey, you're nutritionally deficient, you need this, or you just need magnesium and it'll make you fall asleep. Like there's more to the story. And when somebody has a lot of emotional stuff going on, when there's a lot of emotional turmoil and trauma that's happening with someone, then then they start having issues. And when you start solving the the challenges that people have mentally and emotionally, it, believe it or not, through counseling, if they if they have to go through that or just getting stuff off of their chest, when they go through counseling, when you go through that, then a lot of times the sleep issues resolve. So I would encourage you that if you can't sleep, look at your life, okay? Look at what's going on, whether it's your marriage or no marriage or children or grandchildren or whatever it might be look at that and look and see really what's there and figure out if that's if that's the case or not if it is is there a certain level of pain that you're going through that that's keep keeping that from happening what is it because it's got to be something it's got to be it's something is driving that it's not just something so simple something's driving it so i would encourage you more than anything to to look deep in that now magnesium i'll tell you this it's kind of a go-to i I still recommend getting tested at some level some blood testing at some level but to figure out if you're magnesium deficient a lot of times magnesium is what we call subclinical so you can't even see it on the labs But people aren't getting enough magnesium. And when that happens, that becomes a bit of a challenge. And a lot of times you you correct that and you'll correct a lot in that whole world. So magnesium, that's a big deal is to give the body kind of what it needs and then watch the body respond. It's pretty amazing how that happens. But it it definitely happens and it happens uh, very, very quickly. So magnesium glycinate is usually the one or three and eight are the two different versions of magnesium that tend to work the best when you've got sleep issues because one works on the muscle and one works on the brain cells and the brain crosses the blood brain barrier. So look at those two. Those can be super helpful. Okay. Triple eight, two, eight, three, seven, two, seven, two. That's triple eight, two, eight, three, seven, two, seven, two. Check us out on the web. Go to asarx.com. 
we're here for you. If you haven't checked out the podcast, please do. Go to any of iTunes, Stitcher, Pandora, Spotify, any of those. You can see the the podcast there. Download it, subscribe, be a part of it. And then also don't forget our free book that we're giving. So we're giving a copy of my book out absolutely free. We pay for the book. You pay for a little bit of shipping and handling. We send it right to you. And then you can get started right in the game plan. That is the starting point for sure. If you want to learn how to live a healthier lifestyle, all this stuff I talk about is condensed in one book to make a difference, to make an impact, and to really help you to be able to thrive and not just barely make it. And we want to see you really do well, not just sit around and ho-hum it. We want to see you crush it. That's what this thing's about. All right, food flavors come from surprising sources. I bet you never thought about this. You know, I always say the fruit food flavors and, and like the colorings and all that. Be careful of that with your kids. A lot of people are, are really like um, allergic to it in a lot of ways. So when a lemon is not a lemon, what's lemon flavor? The flavorings around many foods and beverages come from surprising sources. U.S. Food and Drug Administration said you can find out what's really in your foods by checking out product labels. Just because a label says maple cereal doesn't mean it contains any maple syrup. It could be because maple-like flavoring that comes from a maple tree sap or bark could even come from an herb commonly used in Indian dishes called fenugreek. So the cereal also can have artificial maple flavorings that doesn't come from any natural source at all. So FDA said it's not really regulated, and as long as it's on the ingredient list that they approve, So the FDA regulations allow companies to use terms like maple flavored or artificially maple flavored on labels of foods and do not contain the actual ingredients. So the foods just have to contain some type of food or some type of maple flavoring for them to use that. Labels must declare if the flavor comes from an artificial source or not. Not everyone's concerned about that either. Some people just blow it off. But people want to be to be certain a food is made with a certain ingredient they should look for a specific mention of the item in the ingredient list. So, for example, when buying grapefruit juice, look for the words grapefruit or grapefruit juice to make sure that that's where it's coming from. So the director of the FDA, Food Labeling Standards Staff, Felicia Billingsley, said that the consumers have long recognized that products like chocolate pudding, cake, and cookies may be made with cocoa. Billingsley said, if cocoa is listed on the ingredient list, the name of the food can include the term chocolate in certain situations. So they have to use that in order to say certain words. So again, they're just regulating to make sure there's no claims or false claims. That can be lined up in there. So interestingly enough, that's how they look at it. And that's that's exactly how uh, they work it and they word it. So it's, it's interesting to see how that game is played. Because they're, every company that does anything with food is looking for one little angle to not have to use, maybe to put an ingredient in, but can use the word for marketing purposes. Because we know that the marketing on the food packaging is what grabs everybody. Of course, it's got to taste a certain way and all that, but the marketing of the packaging is what's really the most interesting. 888 Give us a call. Go to the website, go to asarx.com. If you haven't got a free copy of the book, go check it out. Go to myfreehealthbook.com, myfreehealthbook.com. You can get it there. And also coming up, I've got some keys you don't want to miss about smartphone use. And it's a link to some health challenges that we're facing. Look, we're in a time now where we use smartphones every day. 86% of the world population has a cell phone. Think about that. So we're almost global with everybody in that category. So we're going to talk about some of the dangers of that when we come back. Find out more, connect with On Call Radio online at InShapeNetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, 888-283-7272. That's 888-283-7272. What are you struggling with? Let's talk about it. Your health, your life. Remember, if the body can get sick, it can also get well. Lifestyle is the medicine. So the choices we make every single day can and will determine the kind of health 
we're going to have. You can thrive. You can really make it. And you can do very, very well. We want to see you do well. Not just bar- not just, just barely make it on, on the, with what we're doing here. We want to see you thrive. To live your potential, become the best version of you. So give us a call. We'll make you part of the show. And then also don't forget Healthy University. Something you should look at. Go to our website. Check it out. It's our community. And it's also our platform to be able to teach you all about what healthy even means, to take you from where you are to where you need to be. Because, look, you can't achieve your goals in life. You can't make the money you want in life. You can't do everything you can, you want to do in life to be your best parents and grandparents and all that unless you have your health. Health is the vehicle to pursue your goals. Health is the vehicle to be able to facilitate and complete all that you're wanting to complete, and that's what this show is all about, helping you do that. Let's get on the phones and talk to Terry. Hi, Terry. Hello, I'm calling on behalf of my husband who has been suffering gastrointestinal distress here for about seven days. Um, He's had diarrhea, cramping, just can't even keep the blandest of of foods, you know, kind of in and, and remaining settled. We've tried scrambled eggs and toast, oatmeal and rice milk and bananas, and He's functioning every day and going to work, but waking him up in the night and just can't be good. Nothing is is staying where it should. I can't believe his body's able to extract much uh, of the nutrition it needs out of what he's putting in. So I'm wondering if you might have any ideas or recommendations. Um, we're thinking if it was food poisoning, it should have passed. If it were some kind of bacterial or intestinal flu, he would have had aches, pains, fever rather than just this ongoing now kind of condition. But maybe we just need to give it 10 days. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, with something like that, if he's got a gastro, it could be something simple. I mean, it could just be an irritation. could be a virus. A lot of could be's. I would I would definitely have it looked at by his primary care and, and tested. You can even have a stool sample done, and they can figure out exactly what's happening. Or because it, if it's been going on that long, it's a little bit long to be consistent. So there's some there's some other factors that could be looked at, but I would definitely have it uh, stool sample or culture done to see to see what the number or see what it shows. Because again, it, it could be nothing, it could be something. So you just want to get it looked at, and that way everything can be ruled in and ruled out. It's not like something you just want to take bentonite clay and ionic silver and just sit there and take it. And no, oh, let's hope it works out. It's usually good to go in and get it looked at. Now, if they tell you it'll resolve or it doesn't look like much, or whatever they tell you, then you can start looking at more of the natural options, but I would definitely get it looked at first. You just need a baseline for what it is. You need them just to give you a good baseline for what you know what's actually there. And then once you get that, then you'll be able to, you'll be able to get a good overview of, of really what's happening, okay? But keep me posted. I want to understand, you know, kind of walk with you through that process, so let me know how it goes. 888-283-7272. That's 888-283-7272. 283-7272. Give us a call. Or go to the website. Go to asarx.com. Now, I talk a lot about smartphone usage. We're seeing it more and more, the challenges. Now we're getting into a time period where most people have had smartphones over about a six-year period, at least many more for me, I know. But for others, they're, they're saying that's kind of the gold standard. And the daily smartphone use, they're saying, offers clues to a lot of the depression. Now, depression is becoming one of the number one diagnosed conditions in the country. So a new study suggests that how you use your smartphone could shed light on whether you might suffer from depression. Involving about 20 women and 8 men, they averaged 29 years of age and looked at the data from people's phones to track the number of minutes they use their phone, as well as their locations throughout the day. And the researchers at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago found they tracked Two weeks of phone use and GPS data from the 28 participants. And the more time a person spent on their phone, the more likely they were to be depressed. Think about that. According to the team led by clinical psychologist David Moore, who directs the University Center in Behavioral Intervention, said, for example, average daily smartphone use by those with depression is 68 minutes. Compared with only 17 minutes of those without depression, the team found. Also, the GPS data showed that people who were depressed tend to spend more time at home and at fewer locations compared to people who weren't depressed, who were out and about doing their day-to-day schedule, going from place to place and doing their thing. So overall, the smartphone data was 87% accurate in spotting people with symptoms of depression they found, and this was in the Journal of American Internet Research. All right, Moore said in the university news release he believes that simply 
by looking at phone data. We can detect if a person has depressive symptoms or not. And what's more, phones can provide unobtrusively and with no effort the part of the user and the data. So two experts in psychiatric health took more cautious, a more cautious view. Uh, Dr. Aaron Pinkasoff, who's the chair of the Department of Behavioral Health in Mineola, New York, said that this is a major issue. And the study sample slanted heavily toward older women who tend to have higher rates of depression. He also believes that physicians and patients should rely and be wary of relying too much on technology and self-diagnosis with the smartphone. And that's becoming <laughs> more and more. I mean, I, I go into clinics now, and it's like, don't rely on Dr. Google, right? Just stop Googling your condition and coming up with what you think you have. Go to your doctor, let them figure it out. I agree with that. I mean, it's one thing to just get on the rabbit trail and figure figure you have some kind of wild condition, some major genetic disorder that that's that that only three people in the whole world have because you have these symptoms, and you go to the doctor and you figure out it was gas. I mean, right, right. So it's like it, that happens all the time. So you really got to be cautious. You know, let let the doctors be doctors. Do your research so you're kind of in the know and have an idea. But don't oh don't come in there all oh I know what it is. Oh, I've got this. Oh, I need this medication. Like, really? Okay. 888-283-7272. You're listening to Ace Rx. Go to acerx.com. You can easily jump in. And, of course, we got our free book there. You can get go to myfreehealthbook.com. We'll send you a copy. As well as you just got to cover the shipping. And we'll, talk, we'll pay for the book, send it to you. It's a hardback copy. It'll give you a real encouragement to where you are right now with your health. Lisa in Bloomington. Illinois said, my doctor has diagnosed me with low thyroid function and wants to put me on Synthroid. What do you think? I think that you should look into iodine treatment and see if you're deficient. Get your doctor to check that. That's what I think. Hi, it's Asa. I'm giving you a copy of my best-selling book for free to help you in your health journey today. I'll pay for the book. All you do is just cover the small shipping and handling costs Go to AsaRx.com and get your free book today. To find out more, visit the show online, InShapeNetwork.com. That's 888-283-7272. What are you struggling with? Let's talk about it. Your health, your life. Remember... If the body can get sick, it can also get well. Lifestyle is the medicine. So the choices that we make every single day can and will determine the kind of health we're going to have. It's all about lifestyle. It's all about choices. And really, it's all about what you decide to do each and every day. We want to help you, encourage you, and equip you to be able to thrive with your health. And on this show, we can do that. Have you ever been a big fan of cabbage? I want to jump in and talk about this food a little bit. Uh, you know, Just about every food has been studied. Foods are medicine. In, in the United States, we don't have a lot of journaled studies on foods, but in Europe, they've done a ton of it, so it's really easy to gather the research. British Medical Journal is fantastic, by the way. So cancer prevention tops all other areas when it comes to cabbage. There's been more than 475 studies that have examined the role of this cruciferous vegetable in cancer prevention, and in some cases, cancer treatment. The uniqueness of cabbage in cancer prevention is due to three different types of nutrients found in it. It's antioxidant rich, anti-inflammatory rich, and it's rich in what's called glucosinates. Now, the antioxidant related benefits of cabbage are pretty strong. So cabbage ranks in the rating system of all the foods as an excellent source of vitamin C and is a very good source of manganese. But in terms of antioxidants in the newer phytonutrient category, cabbage is impressive even among all the cruciferous vegetables, the polyphenols rank at a top for the list of phytonutrient antioxidants in cabbage. In fact, one group of researchers have described polyphenols as the primary factor in cabbage's overall antioxidant capacity. So even white cabbage is a very light colored form of green cabbage. And the most commonly eaten variety of cabbage in the U.S. provides about 50 milligrams of polyphenols and a half cup serving. Red cabbage is even more unique among the cruciferous vegetables, providing about 30 milligrams of the red pigment. 
So these anthocyanins qualify not only for antioxidant nutrients, but also as anti-inflammatory nutrients as well. The antioxidant richness of cabbage is partly responsible for its cancer prevention. So something to really think about. Chronic oxidative stress, which is what we see in and of itself, can be a risk factor in the development of cancer itself. So anti-inflammatory benefits, there's a lot. So without sufficient intake of anti-inflammatory nutrients, regulation of our inflammatory system can be compromised. And we can experience the problem of chronic inflammation, especially when combined together with oxidative stress and chronic inflammation, it's a risk factor for development of cancer. The anthocyanins found in red cabbage are well documented in this case. Now these glucosinates I'm talking about, what are those? Well, they're really big on cancer prevention. So given the roles of oxidative stress and chronic inflammation as risk factors for cancer, the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory richness of cabbage would provide anti-cancer health benefits without the addition of cabbage's glucosinates. But glucosinates are found and here's the deal what they really help against are things like bladder cancer there are a lot of the estrogen based cancers okay bladder cancer breast cancer colon cancer and prostate cancer now if you don't know much about the colon cancer it's second leading cause of cancer so number one is lung if you didn't know that number two is colon so we get hung up in breast and prostate because we hear about it all the time but the reality is lung is number one still worldwide and then number two is colon. Do you think about it? Air quality and the food quality. And then everything else kind of stems after that. But those are your main cancers right there that people struggle with. And those are ones you definitely don't want to have, right? No fun. I've watched so many people, loved ones, go through it, go through the process, and it's, it's, not, it's not a fun process to watch. And it's definitely not, I'm sure, to be the one going through it either. So it becomes a big challenge for anyone that has to face that. So your habits, folks, I mean, your habits are so important. The food you eat every single day, the choices you make, the relationships you keep, the exercise you do or don't do, all of that makes a difference and impact in your overall health. It really does. So that's the big key. Now, we're talking about cabbage and its benefits. Got a lot of benefits. We're talking about digestive tract support, too. Go to asarx.com. You can find more information. I talk about this sort of thing in the articles and, and blog and whatnot. Go to asarx.com. You can check it out. But it's got great digestive tract support. So we're talking about cabbage and what it can do. It's strong anti-cancer, strong immune system, strong for cardiovascular. We're going to talk about in just a minute. But it's got a long-established health and research in the role of cabbage juice helping with stomach ulcers. So these peptic ulcers that people get, cabbage juice can help to relieve that and help make it work better. So the nutrients, the nutrients of these glucosinates can be helpful. ITCs are made for them. Antioxidant polyphenols and amino acid substances called glutamine. Glutamine's huge, by the way. And in the case of these ITCs, digestive tract benefits include proper regulation of bacterial populations of things like Heliobacter pylori. Okay, H. pylori, if you ever heard of that. Well, cabbage and cabbage juice is great at working with that and defending it or defending against it. So cardiovascular support's another big one. This one I really get excited about. Anytime I can find a food that does so much can help so much and do, and just do so much is that's really the main game plan. All right. So you can count on cabbage to provide a couple things. Number one is cardiovascular system with valuable support in the form of cholesterol reduction. Researchers understand exactly how this process takes place. Your liver uses cholesterol as a basic building block to produce bile acids. And these bile acids are specialized molecules that aid in the digestion and absorption of fat through a process called emulsification. So the molecules are typically stored in fluid form in your gallbladder. And then when you eat a fat-containing meal, they get released into the intestine where they're ready to help the fat for interaction enzymes eventually absorption up into the body. So when you eat cabbage, the fiber-related nutrients in this cruciferous vegetable bind together with some of the bile acids in the intestine in such a way that they simply stay inside the intestine. So when this happens, your liver needs to replace the, lo the lost bile acids. So that's a big, big piece with it that we have to look at. That's a big one. So one of the keys you've got to look at, I think, 
you've got to look at the bile acids and what they're doing. But bottom line is cabbage makes an impact. And even if you want to just blend it up in your smoothies or make your own separate meal by itself, cabbage is something you can include in your, in your routine with your vegetables every single day and never go wrong. Like it's got so many benefits. And guys, here's the deal. We got to watch out for excess estrogens that can build up in our system from the food supply. And this is a great way to do that. Cabbage is a great way to to avoid that and make sure that it stays out of your system in a great way. 888 Give us a call. You're listening to Asa Rx. Right here, go to AsaRx.com. All right, let's talk to Elsa, who's on the phone. My challenge right now is that I've just recently quit smoking as of last Monday. Um, I'm on a health regimen um, that I've provided for myself, which is smoothies and, you know, eating fish and chicken, no fried foods, no extreme carbohydrates. So I'm just trying to see what it is that you all can help me with to um, do better in the way of eating and then also help me stay away from the smoking. Right. So uh, the biggest thing is, first of all, congratulations, you quit smoking. Like that is a huge deal. Like, woo, like that's a huge deal. I'm excited for you. That's a big step. It is. So when you can recognize, hey, I've got to make some changes. I know how smoke, how hard smoking can be for people to to quit and to give up. But when you have certainty, right? When you have a certain reason why, when you have a loved one or you love yourself enough or you love others and you say, you know what? I am going to stop this. This is the behavior that's going to take me down the wrong path, down the wrong road, and I'm just going to stop it. So when you get to that point, I think that's a big deal, and I'm pretty, I'm really excited for you because that is that's that's amazing. So with that being said, yeah, I I think that really your starting point for you is going to be your eating habits. Don't forget that that's your number one. So even if it's things like the nicotine receptors you're going to be fighting against because that's what creates the addiction and the dopamine receptors that get affected by that. Yes. All that's important. Yes. All that matters. But the other thing I want to encourage you with is that there's so much more to it. Meaning that you can get to a place where you don't have to be stuck. Okay. You, you can get to a place where you don't have to be in a, in a tough position. And I would just say to you that if you start with things like the anti-inflammatory based diet, if you eat equal amounts of lean protein sources like chicken, fish, beef, or eggs, low glycemic carbohydrates in the form of fruits and vegetables, healthy fats, things like almonds, walnuts, cashews, avocados, if you really start to get that balanced out, get the gut flora balanced out, the right kind of amino acids, the right kind of probiotics, and you get all that lined up, then you're going to be in a good position. And that's where I would start. I would start there. Because once you do that, then with what you're working on from an addictive standpoint, your body's going to be built like a fortress. And then get some lab tests done to figure out what your overall nutritional deficiencies are. Because your gut health is going to be the first and foremost. Once you clear the inflammation out of that, then you can start checking to see what your deficiencies are. Deficiencies are key, as you know. You've got to make sure the deficiencies are down and that your, your body is strong and that it's able and that it's, it's positioned in a really good way for you to be able to, to really do well. So I would, I would start there, eating habits. If you need help, go. you can get a free copy of my book. Just go to myfreehealthbook.com and we'll send you a book for free. We'll just send it to you for free. You just got to cover the shipping. Take care of the little shipping cost and we'll send you the hardback copy for free. Go to myfreehealthbook.com, okay, huh? started there keep me posted on how things are going because you're you're going the right way like you quit smoking that's huge i'm so proud of you connect with on call radio and watch on call tv at inshapenetwork.com Welcome back to the show, 888-283-7272. That's 888-283-7272. What are you struggling with? Let's talk about it. Your health, your life, 
Remember, if the body can get sick, it can also get well. Lifestyle is the medicine. So the choices we make today can and will determine the kind of health you're going to have. Our choices matter. You don't have to be stuck where you are. You really can do well. You really don't have to just stay where you are. And on this show, we want to help you live your potential and become the best version of you. Low blood pressure, I want to talk about for just a minute. It is a hot topic. And a lot of people don't even realize they have it, but yet it's actually linked to a death risk. You always think high blood pressure. Well, that's a death risk, right? Because you're dealing with high blood pressure, potentially for heart disease. But what about low blood pressure? We never talk about it much. Lowering blood pressure to a healthy level, it's a goal for a lot of people. But chronic kidney disease patients with very low diastolic blood pressure, okay? Pressure can go too low and it's linked to a higher risk of death. New limits for a safe level of low blood pressure may be in order, researchers say. So there's about 600,000 kidney disease patients right now in the U.S. Researcher uh, Kasaba Kosevi at the Memphis Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Tennessee looked at about 18 million blood pressure measurements and found that for patients with either very high or very low blood pressure, mortality went up substantially. That's a big one. So researchers found that blood pressure is in the range of 130 to 150 over 70 to 89 were associated with the best outcomes in clinic, and even men with kidney disease had better outcomes. So with chronic kidney disease, though, then that's where the concern is. The more than 20 million people affect kidney or have kidney disease based on the, what the CDC has said. And one of the main messages in this is that the fuzzy boundaries of normal blood pressure tend to be a, a big piece of this that we're looking at. So 90 over 60 should prompt a checkup. So if it's 90 over 60, that person definitely needs to get everything looked at. That's super, super low. 110 to 115 over 70 to 75 is actually a sweet spot for a lot of people, okay? You start cranking up in the 130s and all that, you need to get it looked at. So what do you do about two, two symptoms of too low of blood pressure? Well, it's a good idea to get medical attention. If you get dizziness or lightheadedness, that's an, that's an issue. Uh, fainting spells, feeling cold and clammy, blurry vision, feeling tired. A sudden change of lowering one blood pressure can be more concerning for an underlying health issue. However, in most cases, as long as the patient's not experiencing any symptoms, there's no cause for alarm. There's really not. So it's it's one of those things that you you realize what it is, you maintain it. And another thing that's not listed here that I got to tell you is sometimes the lack of salt in the diet because we're so freaked out over salt. But good Celtic Himalayan pink sea salt that has full of minerals, trace minerals, is actually really good for you. And if you've got an adrenal condition, which usually does not get looked at, but if you have an adrenal condition, that can be researched. And many times that can be one of the main reasons that you've got low blood pressure. So I'll get that checked out first. Make sure you get the, as you get all this other stuff checked out, make sure the adrenals get looked at because if adrenal output is low, then you're going to have low blood pressure. And then that can be easily remedied by salt and rest. And then that can bring up everything and it's not even kidney related. So there's a lot of things like that that need to be looked at. But I would first and foremost get it checked out and see what your body's doing in that regard. That's a big deal. Okay, let's get on the phones and go with Alexa. Hi, Alexa. I take methyl track injections every week for my arthritis. I got rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, and many other uh, chronic diseases. Well, I'll tell you, so with arthritis, one of the big things you got to step back and do it, and this is important. Remember, it's an itis. So itis means inflammation. And if it's rheumatoid, of course, there's a, there's a strong autoimmune component to it. And that's, that's definitely an indicator for this. So you got an autoimmune condition that's probably kicked in. But then if it's osteoarthritis, sometimes people have both. That's just more of a wear and tear. And a lot of times it's more nutritionally deficient or nutrition de uh, deficient related. And once you build those areas back up, then you can kind of rebuild your game plan and it can make a difference. So I would focus in more than anything on getting the inflammation down. It's kind of our basics of what we teach here. So if you need a free copy of my book, go to myfreehealthbook.com. You can get a copy of it and you will send you, I'll pay for it. I'll send it to you. You just got to cover the shipping, pay for the shipping costs and we'll send you the book and then you can get started. It's got a great anti-inflammatory diet in there. Basics gives you really a good place to start and, and really lines up everything for you because you got to realize that with arthritis, 
it's an itis, right? So there's pain involved, it's inflammation, but where does inflammation start? Inflammation starts in the gut. And when inflammation starts in the gut, then that's where, that's where the challenges happen. If you don't take care of the gut, if you don't keep the gut healthy, then you're gonna, that's where, you're, that's where everything begins to kick in. So start there and then figure out exactly what nutritional deficiencies you have. So in some areas of your body, it's gonna be high and low. Some areas are gonna be much better than others, right? So you gotta figure out what those are. But I'll tell you, this is super important too. I'll tell you this, that as you're walking through this process, make sure, and, and this is a big deal with arthritis, is that you keep moving. <laughs> See, when everything hurts, everybody stops moving. No exercise, you cut it out, you kind of get couch bound and you don't wanna do anything because it hurts. But if you will start doing some kind of motion, I will, incur, I will tell you this, all the studies are showing that if you'll just get some kind of exercise, I mean, get in a pool and walk around, jump up and down on a little, little mini trampoline, walk, just get on a bike and ride if everything hurts. But do whatever you can to get your body moving because if you do that, if you maintain that and keep that on a regular basis, that's what it's gonna to take to be successful. You're gonna to have to because arthritis is an itis and it's just the joints being inflamed. That inflammation comes from the gut. Start clearing out the gut, you'll start clearing out everything. You'll feel better, you'll function better, you'll move better. I mean, everything will be better. That's the way to look at it. Puts another hour in the charts. I want to thank our producers, Mr. Fig, Derek Allen, and our chief engineer, John Garrison, and the rest of the team. Go tell one person something you learned on the show. Together, we can transform the health of our friends, our families, and our communities. This is the show that helps you live your potential. This is Asa Rx. This show is designed to provide accurate information of a general nature on the subject matter covered. And given with the understanding that neither host nor the station is engaged with rendering any form of medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This information is not approved by the FDA and is not intended to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure any disease. To experience more of ASA RX audio, visit us at ASA